We've got a great show lined up for you tonight. This is the fifth episode of what we're calling the Boat Co. Talk Show here at the Boathouse Collective. So this is a monthly exploration of the diverse, creative, and entrepreneurial stories and talent that reside right here in our backyard, right here in our community. It's a show where I aim to tell the stories behind the stories and get to the heart of the personal journeys and the experiences that are behind the brands and the movements that are being formed here every day. The show's goal is to contribute to a better world by inspiring future leaders and innovators and influencers with stories of positivity, perseverance, hard work, and then ultimately to leave you with some real life lessons. So I'm Derek Sabori. I'm the host tonight. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we're glad, thank you. And we're here again at the amazing dining and cocktail experience that is the Boathouse Collective. So if it's your first time here, welcome. Exactly. We're glad to see you and we're glad, we hope that you become a regular. And if you're already a regular, then you know why this place is so amazing, why we love it, and why it has become a Costa Mesa jewel. With their commitment to community, the arts, music, cultural, you know, community events like this, culinary excellence, and the craft of the cocktail, the Boathouse has become the premier destination in our Southern California area. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Clay Peterson and the entire Boathouse family. So round of applause. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be up here. And um, thank you to the staff. So our guests tonight, though, plant the seed, I think everyone knows, but they're in the retail business, right? And maybe not everybody has insight into what the retail business is like, so I'm going to play a, a short clip before I make my official introduction, just to give you guys a little sense of what it's like maybe on an everyday um, case here. So hang tight while I push play here. This is premium real estate. Hey, did you get in on that friends and family IPO? We're a core image account. I never see that rep. I don't know how much longer I can do this for. What kind of trade out program were we looking at? Nike gives me any terms I want. It's just a price game now. Who sold more this week? Us or Jax? Retail's tough. It hasn't been comping. Are you freaking kidding me? I didn't order that. You ever try to sell a watch to somebody with no money? Am I open to buy? Tapped. Can I get your sales manager's cell number? Do we have a kid in here? <laughs> Let's just do sticks. We're all about customer service. I need buyback dollars. <laughs> Tell your sales manager I saw a ton of your shit at Costco today. Amazon, killing me. Can you just write that order for me? You gonna buy something, kid? I'm a big believer in karma. And how about a trip to Tavi and Baldface for me and my crew? Are you sure this isn't already here? I know it's late, just make it happen. When did you start selling direct? Dude, you okay with gray orders? Uh, I was a West Coast chairman of bra. Where's that thing? Big dreams? I call them nightmares. Is that gonna be on wheels? The guys down the street are discounting everything. I really don't have time for this stuff. Come on, Rock. Up, 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 up. Ah, go get it. Are you kidding me? Lost checks in the mail. What's my terms? Joe, what size was that? Shop of the year. You're the only brand not working for me right now. We're gonna make some money. We only need a couple. Chad and Andy, I already talked to them about it. They're into it. If I see another sample sale on the corner, I'm coming after you, bro. <laughs> oh, shit. All right, so beyond that short intro, our guests tonight, I think, need little introduction. If you've bought a surfboard or a wetsuit in Newport Beach or a pair of board shorts or sandals for your kids here in Costa Mesa, then chances are that you've met Duke and Paul at one of their Surfside Sports locations. Some of you have been friends with them for many years. They're local retail legends. Duke Educas and Paul Burnett, co-owners of Surfside Sports. <laughs> They've run, they have run the action sports industry pillar since 1992, and they were in the business for years prior to that. Tonight, we'll talk about their early days, the journey, the risk, the rewards, and the relationships that have fueled their business for the last 30 or more years. So please join me again in welcoming to the stage Duke and Paul. So it seems like you've got a few friends here. 
<laughs> I would say you got, a, you got a couple. But Duke and Paul, so for 30 or some odd years in business together. So first of all, that's a huge accomplishment, and I congratulate you on that for sure. Thank you. But I want, I mean, your business partnership is only half the story, right? Um, you guys have been buddies since, Duke, you were in the seventh grade. So how did this epic journey that is Surfside Sports, how did this begin? Where did it begin? Take us back to that. That young lady right there. My this one right here in the blue. Beautiful sister. We owe it all to her. Is that Claudine? That's Claudine. Hey. I started dating Duke's sister, and uh, that's how I met him. So you guys were how old? Paul was, uh, I don't know. I was in you were 12, seventh you were, grade, yeah. whatever that is. <laughs> 12 years <laughs> old. Paul was a little older than that. <laughs> 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 but the, the, uh, the thing about it was my sister, and she still is, but you know, like, she used to be even hotter than she is now. She had a lot of boyfriends. And uh, my dad was really super strict. I mean, thank God she was, he was so strict with her because like, she broke the mold for strictness because there was no rules for me. Yeah. But as a little boy... If some guy like Paul wanted to take my sister to the drive-in, guess who had to go with him? Chaperone. Right and I learned, because my sister has so many wonderful boyfriends, how to milk the system. Yeah. You know, like if you want a little extra popcorn, you want an extra hot dog, just go to one of these guys. Says they weren't taking my sister anywhere unless I was in the back seat. So you could have found yourself in a different business. We're lucky we, you, we, we're lucky you ended in retail. Right. Right? right. Now, what were your first impressions of, of each other when you guys first met? Let's start with you, Paul. <laughs> what did you think of Duke? Uh, he, yes, but Kathy was about to say it for me. Uh, he was a brat. He was a mama's boy. He was unbelievable. <laughs> Oh, yes, dumping his cake in the milk and eating it with a spoon. It was... So, before... before Tom Maurice long... taught me that, because I used to <laughs> hang out, yeah. Before long, though, you guys are hanging out, though, at some point. You're hanging out, you're building a bond, you're yeah. building a relationship, right, and you're right. becoming buddies, right? right? And I would imagine you find yourself hanging at the beach. Tell me about those early days, though, leading up to... Before, you're, before you became... Before we met, it was... Uh, you. I grew up with Aaron Pye, the owner of uh, HSS, and uh, we were longtime childhood friends. And uh, every summer, Aaron and I used to hitchhike down Beach Boulevard. And, you know, back in those days, there was nothing wrong with that. We had no bus system. Yeah. And uh, Aaron's mom would pick us up on the way home. So that was my introductory to surfing. And uh, we had a group of friends that we'd meet down there, and Aaron was always the best surfer. And uh, I never even had a surfboard. I would just use one of Aaron's. So uh, that was uh, my introduction. And we met guys like David Nueva down there, and they were our idols. Yeah. And this is long. Aaron and I were just groms, you know, seventh, sixth graders hitchhiking to the beach. And then eventually, though, so tell me more about what does Aaron go on to do, and what, where does this lead? Where does that friendship lead? Uh, yeah, you know, Aaron and I continued to be friends for many, many years. He was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his. He's uh, David's godfather. I mean, we were we ran really deep. And uh, we shared so many wonderful childhood and adult experiences together. We were each other's mentors. We were, we were you know, when we were very young, we hung out with a group of really bad kids. And most of them are either dead or in jail. And Aaron came to me and said, you know, Duke, are you kind of like sketched hanging out with these guys? Because they're doing some pretty sketchy things. I go, yeah, if our parents ever catch us, Aaron, we're, we're dead. Because we were more afraid of our parents than we were of the police. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, we uh, gradually broke away from that and started our own deal. And uh, we, our bond got even tighter. And as we grew up, you know, Aaron Aaron uh, bought HSS, and I met guys like, uh, like EJ, who's in the room today, and uh, the Ostis brothers, and Chris Sines, and Darren Bradley, and a whole bunch of people that, that uh, you know, I, I became part of that HSS DNA more through a, a sense of osmosis and actually working there. And then I think it was in 1988, Aaron uh, wanted to open another store, and he asked me if I would run it for him. So that lasted for a while, and... Uh, Real quick, so the, the original store, that, that first hs and store, where was that one at? Uh, 1506 Pacific Coast Highway. Okay. And well, that's where, like, I first met guys like Bob Hurley, yep. uh, Jake Burton, uh, 
uh, it was the, high, the heyday of the gotcha days, the stubbies, uh, lightning bolt, dolphins. I mean, it was, a, it was a whole, that little 15th Street store we used to sell, what was it, EJ, like 50 wetsuits, full suits a day out of that place. It was insane. 1,500 square foot store doing that kind of volume. And uh, the only store that was, was, for lack of a better term, more of a powerhouse than HSS was Newport Surf and Sport, mm. and that was uh, Paul Fusing Stamps' deal. Uh, but it was uh, way different back then. I mean, you got to look at it like, you know, not even Nordstrom's had surf clothing. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted the real deal, you had to go to a, a, a core store and get it. So, so you're getting your feet warm in the surf shop business. Paul, what are you doing during those, those early days while Duke's warming up there at HSS? Uh, for a number of years, I was in the uh, trophy and ad specialty business, and then after that, uh, doing an import uh, business and still like trophy parts from Britain and, and Ireland. And then after that, I went to work for a Korean company, and when Duke was managing the store, uh, the Warner store that he helped open, uh, I was trying to persuade the Koreans that uh, Jeju-do, which is an island off Korea where a lot of their uh, married people, when people get married, go to for honeymoons, that there was an opportunity to like open a surf shop there, that it was beginning to be something that could be done. Mm. But it turned out I was too far ahead of my time on that one. And, and now how, I'm going to step back a little bit even too. So how did you, because you were a surfer early on. I know you've got yeah. some early surfing stories. Tell us a little bit about that because you were, even though you weren't in the surf business yet, you were in love with surfing and were, and were doing surfing at, in, at school. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I started surfing in 1960. I don't tell people how many years anymore. I just tell them the, the year I started. Yeah. It's, it's too far back. But... Uh, and eventually, I went to UCLA. Uh, I, uh, Mark Richards transferred there uh, later from Valsurf. Valsurf. Uh, I was one of the ones who was instrumental in starting the URA Surf Club. And we ended up uh, starting contests against other universities and stuff from there. And did that exist before you guys started it? Was no. It, yeah, no, it wasn't it was really like, a thing. There were surf clubs, Wind and Sea and Bay City Surf Club. There were some ones like that. But no one had started trying to do surfing like a, a competitive sport between schools. So it was kind of like UCLA. We were kind of the first ones to come up with that idea. Yeah. And did you guys win? Were you a winning team? We, we, won, we won some. We lost some. We had some good guys. Andy Newman, uh, Rod, Rod, oh, what was his name? I, but we had some good guys to surf for us. But most of us were working hard enough just to try and keep out of, uh, to keep our grades up so we didn't end up going to Vietnam. Uh, so <laughs> surfing was kind of like secondary to just keeping your, your grades up. Okay. And what was your background? What, what were you studying? What, what did you think you were going to do for a living? Uh, I ended up in, a, uh, I was trying to graduate from business, and they were closing down the undergraduate business school, so I ended up in economics, which I just barely survived. <laughs> but I did get one semester of accounting, and I learned if you debit something, you've got to credit something, and that's managed to keep me being the bean counter that I've been for us all these years. Remember those real life lessons I was talking about, <laughs> debits and credits? It's all important, right? And Duke, you had a different background. Neither of you necessarily knew you were going to end up working in retail and, and surf shops. What happened was that uh, eventually Duke and Aaron kind of had a little bit of a parting of the ways. And I said to Duke, do you like what it is you're doing? Mm -hmm. Which was managing the surf shop. And he said, yes. And I said, okay, let's go and try and find a place of our own. And we ended up looking, we looked in uh, San Clemente at what then was the Herbie Fletcher store. We looked in, at, in La Jolla at what was then La Jolla Surf Systems. We even ended up talking with Con Colburn, that's a name from the 60s, who had, was selling his place in Santa Monica. And eventually we ended up talking with a young couple that had bought from the Faria brothers a store on Beach Boulevard in Huntington that was called like Beach Surf Center okay. when they took it. And that ended up being the store that we, we bought in 88. What'd you call it? We kind of changed, first of all, it was Beach Surf Center. When we got it, it had kind of been changed to Beach Surf and Sport. We ended up changing it again to Duke. 
And I felt really uncomfortable about that, and I want to explain really? why. Really? Be honest. Yeah. Be honest, Duke. Yeah. It was uh, Robert Hausen. I don't know how many of you know Robert Hausen. He had a yeah. girlfriend at the time who was uh, uh, go- gone to school, and she, w- she was a big marketing expert, and she came up with this big presentation that this store should be called Duke, the Pulse of Surfing. Ooh. It's got a like, ring. It can, I'm like, really? I just learned to stand up. I'd yet to have done the bottom turn yet, as EJ pointed out. <laughs> and I felt really uncomfortable because what about Paul? And, well, you got a cooler name. Uh, okay. And Paul was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's right down at Duke. She's got a freaking PhD in marketing. It's going to work. And I'm like, oh, dude. So it ended up going from Duke the Pulse of Surfing to Duke Repulsive Surfing. <laughs> So uh, this, is a, this is a talk about being entrepreneurs and starting businesses, though, too. Where did you guys get the money? Did it take the same kind of money it would take to open a, a shop now? Was it just, did you guys dig deep into the pockets, borrow from family members? Did you have it? Had you made it? Uh, I had inherited some money from a cousin mm. of mine that had passed away. And that was basically the seed money that we used okay. to uh, buy that store. Then when we had the opportunity to buy Surfside, we, uh, I felt that we really needed to have somebody else to help kind of spread the risk around. And so we brought in uh, Ron Harcharek as a, a, a partner in the business. And that's how we got together to buy Surfside in 92. So before we get to 92, that your experience, so you ran Duke, the Pulse. The Pulse of the Pulse. Of, the Pulse. Uh, can we just call it the Pulse? <laughs> you ran the Pulse of Surfing for about four years there. Yeah. Right? And so was that a good run, though? And, and I want to know maybe about that transition before you decide that, hey, we've got an opportunity to go buy this shop down, down here in Newport Beach. No, it wasn't a good run. Not at all. We couldn't get any of the, the A brands. It was a lot of fun. I met a lot of really good people, a lot of nice customers, a lot yeah. of great industry people. Uh, but it was not a good run. Then that's it, a huge risk, then, to go risk. and make an investment and uh, go to the next step. We also went through a number of things, like that's when you had the, um, I think it was the American Trader, the big, yep. huge oil spill. Yep. Mm. Uh, we had one or two summers where literally the sun would come out for like an hour in the day and uh. then just disappear for the whole rest of the day, and the whole summer was that way. It was tough. It I didn't, tough I didn't know if we were going to make it. Paul, Paul had to go get another job, and I ran that place solo with a couple of employees that would only work the weekends. And it was, uh, it was very tough. And it was like, oh, my God. I mean, I, uh, it, how are we going to make this work? My family, uh, I had to feed my family. Luckily, like my wife is very understanding. She goes, we got to give this a go. And you have to have a supportive spouse. Like Paul and I both have supportive spouses in order to make something like this go. Because it's, it's not all about a roses. Uh, it is uh, any, any person that starts a business and thinks it's going to be an instant success they, bet, they better check twice with their, with their egos, their conscience, and their spouse when it comes to feeding their family and making ends meet because yeah. it's very difficult. Well, and even talking about difficult, you'd, you'd, I think you told me a story. Was it a sort of reality check? What was the first day of business there, like there at Duke at the surf shop when we got ripped off? <laughs> yeah, so, so this was well, this a welcome to the real yeah, world this moment? Was what, it was my first day. I had left HSS, and that was tough as it was. It was my first day, and I was in the back working on a wetsuit rack, and a group of guys came in. I'm like, wow, these guys are buying a ton of shit. They're putting it all up on the counter, and, and Paul's watching, and he's excited. Next thing you know, those guys picked up all that stuff, ran out the door. There was a car waiting, and we lost God knows how much merchandise, huh? Yeah, uh, and that, that was your was first. Welcome, was that literally yeah. your first day? Welcome, uh, welcome to the world of business. I, I always have had a distaste for shit brown uh, Hondas as a result, because <laughs> <laughs> because that's the last thing I saw, kind of going down in Indianapolis. <laughs> and did, <laughs> were you guys both up front watching this, or were like was one of you maybe in the back and you came out, or I mean, did you both just look at each Paul, other? And we go, Paul yeah. ran after him. He ran down the street like he could catch a car going 50 miles an hour. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me, Paul? This, this is over. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> tell me though then, you, you obviously pick up from there and yeah. you, you start to do things, but I'm still interested if things are so tough and you're realizing, hey, this is a really tough business, but yet now there's this glowing opportunity down in Newport Beach on the peninsula, Surfside Sports, Newport Beach comes for sale. Is that right? In, right. Uh, what happened was when we got into 1992, 
I had to say to Duke, you know, if we don't make any money this year, we're going to just going to have to close the place down. Okay, so it's a make or break year. And so that was right. kind of the make or break year. And then uh, I can't remember exactly who it was. Yeah, I think it was Greg Wade. But Greg came in. He was with Victory Wetsuits at the time. And he was saying, oh, Kathy French, who owns uh, Surfside Sports, is, is looking to sell and get out. And I made the, I said, oh, well, we might be interested in buying that. And the next thing I knew, I was meeting with Kathy French and going through negotiations to buy it. It was like the guppy swallowing the whale. Was it, a, was it even a reality when you said that, though? I mean, could you, did you know I, what you were getting we, into? We said that like we were trying to spread shit to just yeah. mess yeah. with everybody in yeah. the industry. And the next thing I knew, we're not messing with them. We're really trying to negotiate with these there was, people. There was a lot of obstacles, though, because Surfside was a good store, but there was only two years remaining on their current lease, and the landlords would not extend the lease to anybody. I mean, other people, Kaipo Guerrero, uh, Milo Myers, uh, they were all trying to make a play at this place, but nobody was stupid enough like we were to sign a two-year lease. <laughs> so there's a two-year lease, and you have no two idea years. what's going to happen yeah. after that. Two years, you could be out on yeah. the street. Yep. Gosh. And the landlords were not cooperative. No. And I told, I remember saying, Paul, no, I'll get, I got this. I'll, get, I'll freaking con them into an extra five-year lease after that. And we did it. And Ron Hartshark was on the same page. Yeah, and it was uh, stressful. Another so, stressful situation. But you brought in Ron, you brought in a partner, mm -hmm. and it, did that complicate things? Did it make it easier? Because all of a sudden you went from you two knowing each other from seventh grade, and now there's a third, a third wheel in there. Yeah, I don't know, uh, I don't know about you, but it didn't really complement it for me because I really liked Ron. Mm. He was a good guy. Where did you guys know him from? Uh, his uh, sons surfed for us. Okay. When, uh, I met them down at the Warner store. A lot of those Marina kids, like like uh, Keenan. Ryan Keenan, who's yeah, here tonight, they all went to there. Marina and Brian Alper and the Hart Sharks and, and a whole bunch of those kids. And when we moved to Duke Surf Shop, the pulse of surfing, <laughs> they, they followed. And so Ron we met because he was Jason and Justin Hart Sharks' father, father, and we sponsored his kids. Yeah. Uh, and uh, anyway, and so it wasn't really, it wasn't hard for me because he really didn't do that much as far as the day-to-day -day no. things. I mean... Paul did the books. I did what I do today, manage the floor and the buying and overseeing all that bottom stuff. And he just kind of would say, and you can relate to this, Chase, Duke, how we doing? <laughs> 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 and if I said okay, he was okay with it. And Paul, so, you want to speak to that? How huh? difficult was it for you? It, it was... It was a bit difficult because I would, had thought when we took him, when Ron had joined us, that he would play a, a participative role in the business. Mm. And it ended up that he did not. And it made it a little more difficult simply because we were looking for somebody who was going to help work with us. Yeah. And instead, he was, didn't do that. But we, shall, we went on anyway. You made it work. Now, I remember when I was talking with you guys, though, that you said that, that this was the, your, really your big first roll of the dice. You said this. I mean, this was a major... Oh, yeah. So once yeah. you come to an agreement, then it's go time. Yep. Is that right? Right. Tell There's no turning that. back. Once you make a commitment, just like in a, in a marriage... Once you make that commitment, there's no turning back. Uh, and the, the end result, if you do turn back or give up, is going out of business. If we're in a marriage, it's divorce. Yeah. Same thing. It was, it was at a time when uh, there was a lot of changes, as there are today, going on in the business. You were just starting to have the rise of PacSun, and that was taking business away from the beach stores. Mm -hmm. Plus, the whole interest in surfing had kind of come to the top. You know, bodyboarding got real huge, all these things. And it was beginning to go down, but I still remember when uh, talking with Ron and telling him, I did not know whether the Duke store, we could get that to really survive or not through the downturn we were seeing. But I said, I know that Surfside can. So it was a Fortunately, gut. Fortunately, it was right. It was a gut feeling. You had a gut feeling. It was a gut feeling. And then also in, some, in 92, you said, you know, surfing is teetering and other things are influencing. Somebody comes and gives you a tip in 92 to diversify. Yeah. Danny Kwok comes in the store once you, uh, many people here in this room knows Danny Kwok but he used to he used to come into Surfside quite frequently and you know he, he's, he's a very flamboyant energetic individual and it's like Duke you, you have you fucking heard about snowboarding this snowboarding thing is going to be the next biggest thing to and I go 
Yeah, 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 Danny. No, no, dude, you gotta fucking get into it. And by the way, how's Volcom doing? Hey, Danny, don't you work for Quicks? Oh, no, yeah. No, but the snowboarding is gonna be huge, huge, huge. You gotta go for it, dude. You gotta. And, and I swallowed the punch. I totally. Uh, okay, okay, all right. Hey, Paul. I need an extra 30 grand because we're going to buy more snowboards, you know. And, and at the end of the day, we started carrying a ton of snowboards. Yeah. And, and it, it was really successful. And I'm not going to say there was rows of normal human beings walking in for it. And EJ, you can relate to it. There was a thing <laughs> called the gray market. And Guido, well, that's who I called Ron Hartcherk. My nickname for him was Guido. <laughs> Guido. <laughs> he was a trick a minute. Trick a minute. Hey, Dookie. How are we going to sell more, some, more of these snowboards to those Far Easterners? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, it was like, that gray market was a, a little sketchy, guys. It was like, dude, I don't know if this is, my, my ethical thing was like, dude, these guys are coming in with suitcases full of, money, full of money and wanting to buy all this stuff. And it wasn't just snowboards. It was everything surf. And uh, it, was, it was a little like creepy, slimy to me. But by the way, EJ was doing it. So it must be okay. <laughs> That's when you start calling around and see what everybody else is doing, so, huh? You know, the gray market, I, the gray market uh, it helped the surf industry a ton. Because back then, you guys, they didn't have quality Japanese distribution. Mm. And honest to God, they would come in and pay full price for it and have a resale license number. And they didn't have to pay tax. Yeah. So you're making full margin, selling tons of product. Yeah. But Remember like with Volcom? When Vulcan oh, yeah. first came out, yeah. I still remember looking from upstairs in the office and seeing these guys. They'd have like the whole rack of T-shirts in one arm, and they'd be going up to the They'd the scoop counter. it up and come Whoa. by. And we used wow. to have to hide it. We had a private reserve of Vulcan back in Scott Baldwin's office, uh, and it was like... So those, the gray marketers didn't even know it was there. So the local groms could come back there. And it really helped us bond with the local groms. Like, oh, dude, this is the private. Secret room. Yeah, secret the stash. secret room. And there was tons of welcome in there because we needed to promote that brand, too. And it was, uh, it was, it was pretty cool. But the gray market really fueled mm. the surf industry. And I could only speak for Southern California in those days when it was tough in surf because they, they bought a lot of stuff. Yeah, and, but it helped. Yeah. It helped. Kind of go the other direction too. Yeah. When all of right. a sudden there was a point at which so the the ASR magazine or something was claiming like that the Japanese market was going to go on for like another ten years and stuff, and I said I think we'll be lucky if it goes on for another five years. And instead, that particular year, that was Done. it. It really? was gone. Paul and I would wow. have these meetings, and uh, Paul, this is scaring me. And he goes, I know, Duke. He goes how much of this stuff is going to gray market and how much can we legitimately sell? And we both agreed that one day, and who knows when, it was going to come to an end. And it was already starting to degrade. Oh, back in the day when it, guys like EJ and I were getting a full pop for us, there were people out there selling at discount, and then those discounts would be heavier. And then we just kind of got out of it saying, no, it's not even worth it to us. And, 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 and we held back, and we developed a local clientele for snowboarding and surf that was able to be sustainable to us in the real world. Yeah. And we didn't have to rely upon gray marketing. And a lot of the people that relied too heavily on it, they simply went out of business. Wow. So that got you through that part of business, but then an acquisition comes about, though. So business is good then for a few years there at the Surfside location in Newport Beach, but you get another opportunity to potentially expand. Is that right? Yep. Across the street. It was in the location that had been the Newport Surf and Sport. Okay. And they had gone through some tough times, and basically the place closed up. And so we ended up going to Bill Blue Rock, who was the landlord, and asked him about, you know, taking space over there. And so we did, and the concept was we were trying to build a store that served kind of a little bit different clientele from what Surfside did. And uh, that worked for us for about five years. And at first it worked really well, but after a time it began to kind of diminish for us, and then we were finally able to persuade our landlord across the street to allow us to expand there and to carry women's clothing and do that. So we ended up expanding in the original location and closing up the Newport Beach Surf Company store across okay. the street. Okay. You so, know, I, I get to put this at uh, this too, Dirk. Throughout the generations, and a lot of them are here tonight, 
It wasn't just me and Paul that made Surfside. It was our employee and our staff who becomes our family. I mean, right. we have some people in this room that date back you know, 20, 25 years, and then we have people that are current employees. And it just, it's, it's, it's important to know that no two people can make this happen. It's, it's a group. It's a family. It's a team. It's, it's something that, that is generated by a certain amount of energy that is from within of a group, like a nucleus. Right. Okay? And maybe me and Paul are a part of that nucleus, but all these other people are equally as important past and present employees. Absolutely. And we talked about, I mean, it's multi-generational. You Absolutely. know, it's like our kids, it just keeps getting passed down. So you guys have done a great job of creating a community space and an inviting place to come and shop and hang out. And I had told you too, your earliest shop down there in Newport was always a comforting, it was a comfortable place to walk into and you always felt welcome there. So you guys have done a great job doing that. And I think it sounds like you guys had some good business, um, uh, you know, happenings but, uh, on and off. But then you kind of hit um, you, you, a sad event happened, you know, right. and that yeah. must have not been easy for the relationship. Yeah, or business it in was. Uh, it was very difficult. Our uh, partner Ron Harchart passed away, and uh, now we were faced with buying out his widow, and it got really weird. And it was one of the most stressful times in my personal life, and I know it was yours too, uh, because it was like we were at odds with a beloved family that refused to believe that our business was only worth what we said it was and the mm -hmm. lawyers got involved and at the end of the day it cost us a lot of money, it cost them a lot of money and they got what we offered them in the beginning but it was, it was very tough. Part of the family was gone and now we were having to pay this price that was really hard to fathom. It was, there, there, there was for lack of a better term, but it's, it's a true term, there was hatred toward us. And uh, it was very difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. So that sounds like one of the lowest. That's why times. they have buy-sell agreements now. Yeah. yeah. Well, you learn. I mean, right? right. Uh, you, you definitely learn. I know you yeah, guys have School of Hard Knocks is a, is a tough education, though. So obviously a low point. What were some of the high points there at that location? What are some of the most memorable times there at Surfside in Newport? I think... There, it, it, it's, it's tough because there were so many. It was all the wonderful people that we had as customers. It was all the wonderful people that we had as employees. Uh, it was wonderful being down there right by the water. I heard and your office was not a bad uh, location. Yeah, I love I loved having uh, the office I had was upstairs. It had a little bathroom shower that no one else wanted to use because all we had was cold water. So, uh, but I was able to just like grab, grab my wetsuit, suit up, go and grab a board, my, grab a board and go out and surf. Yeah. And that helped deal a lot with when things, <laughs> when thi when things got tough. And, but it, and to be the pioneer, one of the pioneers of the upstart of snowboarding. I mean, that, that was like awesome. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? What is this sport that everybody wants to do all of a sudden and they're coming in here and they're... they're they are embracing it, and they're embracing your expertise, and, and quite frankly, it was all new to me, too. It, well, was, uh, it was gnarly. It was in the, such a great... And also, the highlights were things like, you know, we were one of the first retailers to carry Volcom, and when Tucker and Wooly came in with those clothing, uh, it was like, yeah, we should do this. Troy Eckert was with them, uh, Matt Patterson, Kyle Meza, and these guys were a group of guys that had a certain amount of energy that was incredible. Their clothing, clothing at the time was shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of energy. A lot but they, of did, energy. they, they yeah. did all right. They ended up doing all right. Huh? Yeah. And, you know, to be part of that, to help build that company and other companies like Von Zipper. We were yeah. the ver first Von Zipper dealer. Uh, you know, back when uh, Newport Surf and Sport was such a force, you know, we were going head to head with them. But, you know, Tommy Noble would only carry Gotcha, Billabong, Stussy, and Quicksilver. Well, we had Billabong, Gotcha, and Quicksilver, but we also augmented it with uh, Ezekiel, Volcom, SMP, and, and, and we grew those brands, and some of them, you know, got quite successful. Grew them and built relationships with them. Just even seeing some of the photos of you and seeing some of the people that are in the audience tonight, I mean, that's one thing I want to I get to and talk about are some of those relationships and what brands did, did well and which ones didn't, who made good moves and who didn't. But I, I want to get to the point, though, but when the, 
when the hammer drops, though, and you guys get faced with another hurdle in the business where it's time to move. You've got this great location. You are in ideally what would be deemed a perfect surf spot location, and you're, you've got to move. What we thought were, because I can only speak for myself, I was stuck in this, for lack of a better term, once again, it was a rut, but I didn't know it was a rut, is nobody can tell me how to do this thing better. I know everything. I know Newport. This is the way a surf shop should be. If you don't like it, get the hell out of here. Yeah. Okay. And that was so wrong. It opened my eyes to, to bigger and better things when I started touring other surf shops and seeing what guys like Dave Nash and Wally were doing and, 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 and the greatness and how their stories, I felt like a dinosaur or potentially becoming a dinosaur mm-hmm. because it wasn't the world according to Duke. And Paul was a little more open-minded about it than I was. And, you know, he convinced me, yeah, we got to change. And we did. And we upgraded and we, we evolved into the store we are today. And so was it, was it just that gut feeling of knowing that you needed to change? Or was it, what is it, circumstantial? Oh, we, were, we were getting kicked out of you there. Were we, tried, out. We, tried to, we tried to buy the property. Uh, go, go ahead, you talk about that, Paul. Uh, a very large pointed stick uh, <laughs> up our rears. Uh, we, we, tr- we tried to buy the property and got blown off. And eventually we found out that the property was for sale. The landlord didn't want us to know that it was for sale. And eventually we re- I realized we, we weren't going to be able to stay there. And you had been there for 15 years, was it? How long well, were you there? Well, the store had been there. You know, Surfside, we can trace our heritage back to about 1974. That's right, okay. Uh, we'd been in that location since uh, sometime 76, 77, sometime in that neighborhood. Okay. But uh, so we had to look for someplace else, and there was just nothing down there that had the kind of space that we had. Mm. So I came up the hill and started looking around and eventually found this place that had been, it would have been the Rite Aid, and Rite Aid had moved down to the end of the building because uh, in what had been the uh, Gateway computer store at one yeah. time because they wanted to drive through. That's the big thing for pharmacies now is they want to drive through. So here was this big space that was empty, and I remember calling the uh, listing agent or something and just saying, oh, I'm kind of interested in this spot you've got here, but it's, gee, it's a little bit big, you know. Would you consider maybe cut it, you know, making it a little smaller? Well, it turned out that they were at that very time negotiating with Panera mm. to take some of the space. They had had a thing where they were talking with Boot Barn to take all of it, and that had fallen through. So then they got talking to Panera, and Panera was going to take a bit of the space. So we got lucky because what Surfside Sports could have been a boot barn. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we owe it. We owe you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and so, but that, you said, I mean, that's another, that was a, that was a big roll of the dice. So you oh. find the location, you say, okay, we can use part of it. But Duke, when we were talking, you said that was the gnarliest thing in your career because now you've got this big space, you've got this big build, and it ends up being a bigger budget than you thought it was going to be. Yeah, you know, it was something out of my wheelhouse. First of all, there was a lot of money of our own put into it. And uh, then I was faced with the task of going and raising money from all the vendors. And I'm like, how in the hell? I never, I never borrowed a penny from my dad when I needed to feed my kids. I found a way to do it. And I had to go ask people, hey, will you support our business by giving me a hundred thousand are you kidding me who does you know who's going to teach me to? so uh you know it was back in uh i didn't even know where to start because i had to set up these meetings and then uh jason shelton introduced me to a a, a gentleman named uh, charlie cotton from quicksilver and uh he came in one day and i didn't even know he was coming he goes hey dude can i talk to you i want to take off my quicksilver hat and i want to talk to you as charlie cotton to duke from Surfside, and he taught me how to calculate things, and it was kind of like, the best way I can describe it, you're in a geometry class in high school, and you're never good at math in the first place, and you go after school to try to learn more, and the teacher is telling you this, and it's blah, 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 oh, I got it, I get it, I totally get it, and you can do the problem, Yeah. and that's how it was with Charlie. Something clicked in the way he explained it to me, and he taught me how 
to figure this stuff out and to present it in a business-like manner to individuals like, uh, you know, uh, Paul Nadi and to Tom Reese and to Tom Holbrook and to the Burton people and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, I just raised close to a million dollars. But what are you doing? You're calling these guys up? You're calling up no, your buddies? No, no, we had face-to-face -face meetings. Okay. And some were way easier than others. And it wasn't like, yeah, here's the money, Duke. But it was like, hey, this is our plan and calculating on this. Okay, looks good to us. Uh, we'll help So you needed it. them to buy into those spaces, give you some money to help build out the store. Right, right. Build and, their uh, sections. Yeah, and it was money. It wasn't credit. It was, yeah. here's a check. And some checks came immediately. Some checks took a while to come. Like some of the negotiations that took place was, okay, we'll give you this much money, but it's not going to come for six months because of budgets and everything. And, and let me make it clear, you guys, back in those days, there was tons of money in the surf industry. It was just like companies didn't know what to spend it on. And if they found a way to spend it, you, were, <laughs> you, you got the money. It's you're in way the right place now. at the right time? It is way different now. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you start tallying all those up. You get people to commit to certain sections. Right. Does that cover the whole budget? So now are you doing... No, do it doesn't cover the <laughs> <Not> whole budget. <laughs> uh -uh. So what's the gap? What is this build out going to cost you? And what do you guys do now? Well, because you're not open yet. So you've got house, the store. Houses were on the line. Everything we owned was on the line. Bottom line, everything. everything. I mean, if this thing didn't work, we'd be sleeping on tents in Bolsa Chica Beach. So to put it in perspective, you went from working for free at, at, with, with Aaron Pie, you get your Duke, the Pulse shop. Repulsive then, surfing. Yeah. Repulsive surfing. No, it was the Pulse. Then you've got the place down in Peninsula. Things are good. And now you've got this even bigger event going on. But now you've put everything on the line, and you've got scary. It. It's scary. Scared shitless. Okay. I remember going home to Kathy and saying, "I don't, I don't know. I can't sleep at night. I'm doing this." And and she goes, "Honey, we've gone this far. There's no turning back." She goes, "I support you 100 percent, and if we have to, we'll live at my mother-in-law's." Well, I wasn't freaking uh. living at my mother-in-law's. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> in, in, in some ways, it went kind of like. We would the ups and downs we had as we were doing this and going through the negotiations were the pearl mutters and everything, was just such extremes because we've heard uh, there was a point at which we got we were in the negotiations, and Duke starts going to some of the vendors and bringing them over to show the store, and we think they're all going to be stoked about the idea, mm -hmm. and some, more than one of them kind of goes, I don't know about this idea. Well, guys. I'm not going to say who yeah, it was. But somebody says something like this to me. Brew, how can you even guarantee me this is even going to work? <laughs> <laughs> that's not giving away much, though. <laughs> and so that's got to be a confidence blow, though. So here you are. You're, oh, yeah. and probably, you're mortgaging your houses, doing whatever you need to do, and somebody says, hey, I'm not too sure this is going to work. Right. Scary? Scary. 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 But, uh, <laughs> but no, it was, uh, it was like... Just like my wife said, so there's no turning back, and I felt just like a freaking Brahma bull. I got to make this thing work. There's yeah. no turning back. And I learned a lot about myself as far as uh, where you can suck strength from mentally. I'd, I've done it before, like physically in athletics, but yeah. mentally, I mean, you just have to, to toughen up mentally to get through this stuff, or you're going to go crazy. Well, so, and it's one thing to get through it mentally. How about financially? You guys told me that there was this, a moment when you've got a design build out and you get the invoice for it or you get a quote for it and you guys look at each other and wh what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the F word. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that necess wasn't necessarily what you expected, so. No, it was, I, I it know was that an amount of money that we were just like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you, did you, did you have anybody help you? Were there, did, were there any golden well, moments to get you guys a, through it? Yeah, there was, there was a time when one of the contractors that we got invoiced for for $750,000 had, had agreed to, do, to take half amount of payment up front okay. and then half a completion of the project. Okay. And... Uh, we signed up and we That's gave them scary. half of the amount of money and then midway through the project they changed their mind no we need all the money now so they said you we need seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to help you get this store open yeah we we need it no not the 750 half, half of the of 750 we needed it now not 
six months from now when yeah. we were supposed to pay that. Okay. Yeah. And, Did uh, you guys have it? No, well, we didn't have it. <laughs> we, we, right? Well, let's just say we, we managed to, to, to get it. We, the well, house, what, the what houses happened? went even more in, in hawk. But, uh, and, you're, and you're forgetting, too, the point at which we were not that far into the design of the store. And all of a sudden, I was out in Vegas for something. And, do, and I get a call from the fellow who's like our point man with the, the people who are designing the store and are going to build all the fixtures and stuff. And he says, we've just filed for bankruptcy. Mm. So the people that were both designing the store for us and going to buy, build all of the displays and everything, all of a sudden, they're gone. And that's why this contractor that, that did this thing that I was explaining, they were an add-on contractor that wasn't our original one because well, original Blackline ones. went bankrupt mid-project while okay. we were doing it. So I remember it just like it was yesterday. I'm at my computer, and I'm reading my email, and I'm just like, shit. And an industry individual just walked around the corner, and he said, Duke, what's wrong? You, this thing is going to be successful. I go, read this email. And he's going, I can't believe this. He goes, you know what, Duke? Nobody is going to crush your and Paul's dream. He takes out his personal checkbook and has his and his wife's name on it, not a company's name, and writes me a check for $250,000. He said, pay me back in six months. F that guy. No interest. You're kidding. Honest to God story. Yeah. And it was, and it was like, I, I, I kind of thought this guy was full of shit, you know, but he just gave me a quarter million dollars. Just wrote me a check for a quarter million dollars. So I go up and give it to Paul, and Paul goes, holy crap. And I told him the story, and, and uh, we paid, he was the first guy we paid back, and we paid him back within three months, I think it was, wasn't it? And so was that the moment when you knew everything was going to oh, be made okay? Me, like, it made me so confident that that guy believes in me. Man, I must be the shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you are the pulse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what a, hu what a huge, I mean, what a huge um, validation, I guess, of the relationships that you guys have built, the legacy that you built, the friendships that you've built. You know, I think so much of, like you said, it's, it isn't just you guys, it's your community. And I think the longevity of your relationship in the business, it says a lot. And to have somebody come in and vouch for you like that, is trust, is goodwill, and is just you know good, good energy that you guys have built. So I congratulate you on that. And so, Surfside today. I mean, I think we all know we're there. You know, we see it. What's the, what's the update on Surfside today then? So now you made it through your build out. Yeah, you know this. We're in our our tenth year, and uh, uh, we still have a long lease ahead of us that we can. Uh, we have a good lease. We have a rock-solid lease. We learned our lesson from the two-year deal that we talked about before. You yeah. live and learn. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. But and, uh, uh, you know, the Surfside today is, uh, is good. It's healthy. Now, it's I need to rewind because I, I need to step back because I forgot. There was another hurdle that you guys came upon when you were... So one thing, some of you got the money, so now you can finish oh, the build okay. out. Yeah. But you still, it's still not a, it's not, not a smooth road from there. No. Charlie Cotton said to me, I, I told Charlie, he came in, and that was the mentor that taught me how to do it, all this stuff. And yeah. He said, I go, Charlie, things are going so good. He goes, Duke, slow down. He goes, I don't want to bum you out, but it's going to get tougher before it gets better. And he was right. The setbacks we had, like, with Edison. Oh, God. Yeah. With, Tell us the Edison's. Yeah. What was oh, the Edison God. debacle? Yeah. The Edison, uh, when they hook up your electricity, and keep in mind, we just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this thing. And when they hook up your electricity, they can come whenever they want. They can come at 2 a.m. Yeah. They don't need anybody there. They just hook up wires, right? Well, our electrician marked the legs, because there's a lot of power that goes in the surf side. And uh, they hook up the legs, and he marked it. 110, 110, 110. And Edison put 220, 220, oh. 110, and fried every circuit in the store. Oh. And it was approaching holiday. We had our target date to be open was set back by another two weeks, and electricians had to work around the clock. How much did it cost? Ten thousand dollars to have them re put in all new. Yeah, another ten thousand dollars on top of what they originally charged us, and that was more money that we had to 
fork out, but it was emergency. We got it from somewhere, but I think my sister wrote another book, and we got it from <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, there was, there's been a time that uh, people had asked, do, there was a point at which people were asking, do, who's your greatest competitor? And he would say to them, the Edison Company. Yeah. <laughs> because fast forward from that, we opened the, we finally got the store open in November. On Labor Day, the following year, they had the electric, the electricity arced out back. Not our fault, but it's fine. We lost our power on Labor Day. Oh my gosh! 111 thing. degrees in Costa Mesa yeah. that, that we we were run, we were running around with flashlights and other stuff trying to get people to help people uh, and stuff. So after that, people were asking him, you know, who's your greatest competitor? He'd say the Edison Company. They kind of look at him like this. Well, it's, yeah. He'd start explaining to him, and they go, "Oh, I see." It sounds like your biggest competition are is in other retailers and other stores. It's just sort of realities of a business and life. In no, general. That, that's not necessarily true. We we do have competitors. We have worthy competitors, and uh, you know you can you can say what you want about Amazon, and you can say what you want about about any internet things. But I mean, we have some worthy opponents out there, and they're not really opponents. They're retail brethren, people like Jacks, mm. and uh, people like uh, bigger chains like Tilly's and department stores. And, and, and but you know what, somebody told me once, and I, I never heard anything ring so true to me, be aware of what your competition is doing, but don't forget to focus on what you do best. Mm. And uh, that's what we try to do, and everything has worked out. Our, you know, Costa Mesa is such a resilient community, and we have built roots in this community for so long. The only thing I can really put my finger on, Derek, and blame is Mother Nature. Mother Nature is our biggest opponent. When it doesn't snow in the winter, and when it's not sunny with waves in the spring and summer, we're going to get our asses kicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honest to God. Yeah. And that's the truth. How was this winter? Epic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Epic. Best winter ever. Yeah. So... You, you've got some good quotes here, and I want to read this one, too, because when I, when I was going through my notes, I mean, there's some things that I pulled out here that you guys really said that really struck with me. And, Duke, on relationships, you said, being partners is like being married. You have to respect each other's strengths, realize your own weaknesses, and mutual respect is above and beyond everything else. Absolutely. So how do you get through 30-some-odd years of being in business together, plus the multiple years of being friends? What's the secret there? You know, the respect isn't... A force thing. I mean, this is one of the strongest, toughest, highest integrity individuals people I know, if not the most. Mm. I would trust him with my life. <laughs> I would trust him with, with anything because he is just so, uh, he is such a pillar of human humanity. Mm. And he thinks much high, higher of me than of I do of him. Yeah. <laughs> He named the first shop after you. Let's and not I'm not forget. kissing ass or anything, guys. It's the truth. I mean, you look at this guy's face right now. You know, he goes for skin cancer surgery like most of us brush our teeth. And we don't even, yeah, never complains. <laughs> never complains a, a, a bit. I mean, he'll be going through a tough thing in life, and he'll put his nose to the grind. So uh, vendors out there, when, you know, it's, I'm not the guy who pays the bills. When's the last time you guys didn't get a check from Paul? Or when's the last time you got a late payment? I mean, it just doesn't happen because of his integrity. His integrity, his integrity is above and beyond everything else. And if you don't, and just like my wife, my wife is a person of the highest integrity, and that's why I chose to marry her. And uh, you know, it's the same thing, you guys. So to me. This is why your story is so special, though. You know, it really is, because you've got... I love that you, that you give so much credit to each other for being the, the strength, you know, for the relationship to your wives. And I like, Duke, your optimism, though. I always... And this wasn't even... This is something I found, but it said... You said, if there's 15% unemployment, that means there's 85% of the people that have jobs. Right? So you're a positive spin on things. Yeah. Right? So... And in Eastside Costa Mesa, it's probably 110% to have jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, how about this one, Paul? You said, we've watched it go up, we've watched it go down, and your advice was to never spend more than you've got and always be ready for things to go in the opposite direction. You guys have had your ups and downs, right? And so how do you prepare for going forward? Of all the things you've learned now, how does that relate to how you run your business now, and what advice do you have to young entrepreneurs, business starters, brands even, 
what do, what do you pass on to them to have as much longevity as you guys have had? As, uh, among other things, as he is always more than willing to say, don't believe your own bullshit. Mm. And you know, you've got to be humble about what's, what you're doing. And you've got to remember always, I, I, I think about these commercials you hear on the radio where they're always saying, oh, work for yourself, be your own boss and stuff. Our boss is every single person that walks through that door. Yeah. And our boss is every single person that works for us. And we have to keep all of them happy because that's what keeps us in, in business. So I think it's, uh, all you can say, you, what you can say is you always live below your means. That's part of what's managed to get us through a lot of tough times. We never uh, spent more than we, we had. We always made sure we had something in the bank yeah. just in case. And we just always made sure that no matter what was happening to us individually, financially, our vendors got paid. And the result of that is that we've not necessarily, at least in the past, we never were the biggest surf shop, but we always had a good reputation. People in the industry always knew that we uh, were a good spokesman for the sport, that we treated our customers well, and that we did our best to uh, pay them on time. And I think the result was we got support from the industry and from yeah. people where maybe we might not have otherwise because they knew that they could trust us, they could trust our word, and we would do what we said we would do. So uh, speaking of some of those brands then, I mean, you guys have seen everybody come and go, literally everybody, all the brands, you've seen them start and take off, you've seen them start and fail, you've seen the big brands come, you've seen small brands start up. Yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes brands have made and what are some of the, bi the best decisions that you've seen brands make? You know, there's, uh, let's talk about the mistakes first. Okay. okay. You know, we all know and people like to, to beat on Quicksilver like a dead horse for the rosin all thing or, or to, to criticize, and, and who am I to tell a billion dollar company that rosin all was a dumb shit thing? I'm not, you know, <laughs> but my biggest personal uh, mistake that I have seen in all of my years was something that, that was near and dear to my heart. I saw a group of guys from our community work their asses off to take a stagnant brand and I'm even choking up talking about this, called analog to something that I saw back in the day where Vulcan was poised, analog was poised, and when Burton Snowboards pulled the plug on analog streetwear, mm -hmm. it, just about, it was like putting a dagger in my heart because it was, it was poised for greatness. And when that happened, I had lost faith in, in the industry for a while. I just lost faith like, what the F? This is just wrong? How come people can't see this? It was plain as day to me. And, and don't get me wrong, maybe I'm not a big picture global guy, but I could tell because the epicenter of our industry has always been in this area in Huntington yeah. Beach. And if it was gelling in this area, and I saw kids wearing analog everywhere at Newport Harbor High School, at Corona Del Mar High School, kids on bikes running by wearing analog, that group of guys was doing something right. Mm. And we were doing something right supporting those guys. And we had grown that brand from a little single rack into a pretty good sized section. And it was our number three selling brand in the store, wow. making margin up the yin yang and Burton pulled the plug on it. It hurt me. Really? You haven't let that one go? You know, I, <laughs> I don't hold grudges. I think Jake Burton's a great man. Yeah. I just think that he had advisors that didn't get it, mm. and he didn't listen to his advisors that really did get it. And so at the end of the day, it was Jake's fault. Yeah. But I still have a tremendous amount of respect for the man. Yeah. I mean... So how about on the flip side? What was, the, what was one of the most memorable, best decisions that you saw a brand make? A brand make? Uh, brands don't make good decisions. We make them for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that uh, the decisions to segment product, the decisions to back. Uh, specialty retail in certain ways, the decisions not to grow so quickly. I mean, that mm. falls truth with the conscience of 
every brand we carry. Uh, I, I know that I have a lot, to me a lot of personal mentors from several of the brands and, uh, that have really helped me out a lot. And uh, one of them is Tom Reese. Tom Reese, he, uh, he convinced me here? to grow uh, our boys' business to 10 times the original square footage that I'd originally specced. And, uh, and he was right. And another thing, I mean, he came to me and he goes, hey, Duke, have you heard of this brand called Penny? You really ought to carry them. And I went to our hardcore skater, and he goes, no, they're just plastic boards, Duke. I go, well, I want you to buy 10 of them. Well, guess what? We were selling 150 a week. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Old For Tom, a good Tom year. Knows a thing a or good two. year. I mean, you know, and, and, and the other decisions that, that I've personally seen made were, uh, you know, the group of guys that the original Vulcan put together, there was an energy there that was beyond comparison of anything out there. And the camaraderie and the strength of the brand that Bob and Knight was able to maintain with Quicksilver throughout all yeah. those years, it was like, really? They're in Macy's, they're in, in Nordstrom's, they're in here, and they're in PAX, they're everywhere, but we're kicking ass with it. How did McKnight and his team able to pull that? There was great things that have happened within this industry. We have a tendency to dwell on the negatives. And, and you know, like Dick Brake Baker, who I've always remembered, he's a great leader of our, our industry, and, through SEMA, he always says something that always rang true to me. He goes, hey, the past is the past. Never look back. We've got to look for the future. And that future is, I feel like it's our job to navigate that future, but we have to be, you know, not too quick, not too slow. It's a real fine line to figure out, like, where's this thing going? I mean, wh what it was 10 years ago, like, we, I had a, a young uh, uh, a surf shop owner come up to me and say, oh, Duke, I respect you so much because you know everything. I go, hey, hold on a second. I don't, I don't know any more than, than you do because tomorrow is tomorrow. Yesterday is the past. We're not going, I learned from mistakes, but things have changed so rapidly. You're just as competent as, at this shit than, as I am. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah. It's different. And it's constantly evolving. Well, and you guys have, you, like you said, you've learned a lot, but I know there's been some real practical stories, though, too. Tell me even, let's think of just running a shop. What, what, what was, what's your greatest shoplifting story, besides the first grab-and-go that you had? <laughs> the greatest shoplifting story, this is, this is a really cool one, too. It was, uh, <laughs> it was uh, back in, had to be 15 years ago, Okay. and uh, I caught a shoplifter, and... Uh, I walked him outside, and I said, hey, bro, really? I mean, he, he had so much stuff, he looked like a big elephant. And he goes, oh, bro, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he comes walking toward me, and as he got closer, he pushed me down and took off like a jackrabbit. Oh. Just then, seven of our guys who worked for us and hung out, and rode for us <laughs> on the back from TK Burger. And I remember him, it was, uh, it was the Colette brothers, Morgan and JP Colette, uh, Morgan Hill, uh, Sticky Shaw, <laughs> and John Patzold, and maybe one or two other guys. Well, they took off after that guy, and they came back with all of our merchandise. No way. Totally bloody, no blood of their own, <laughs> and every penny of them was in that guy's wallet. And I took it, and I said, I don't want to know anything. I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, and there's one other shoplifting story that you told me that I think is really special that deserves to be told, and it's about getting, getting every penny back. You know, and I think this goes again to your, to your character and the people. A lot of these things I don't think would have happened if it wasn't you guys, you know? Yeah. I mean, who's going to go chase after? It's like, they did that for you. Yeah, but yeah, good point, good you know, point. You know, and I yeah. love... Because of, of the family. Yeah, you've them. created... And now... Here's something. So can you so can you tell me this? Can you retell this story that you told me about your 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 big your big steal? That yeah, that wasn't to. shoplifting. That was internal theft by an entrusted employee. Okay, and a trusted employee that the it was his, it was during Jason Shelton's uh, uh, era. Jason worked. It wasn't me. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. Jason. For the it record, wasn't Jason. Yeah. <laughs> so one of our. Uh, and the guy was like, he was the same, Jason was a manager, this guy was a manager, and there was a couple of other managers. And each one of them came to me and said, hey, Duke, I really got to talk to you. Something stony is going on with so-and-so. I go, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I, just keep an eye. 
you know, and it was casual like that. It wasn't like, oh, I want to get a raise, so I'm going to narc on it. It was just, hey, there's something weird's going on, Duke. I don't yeah. know exactly. And this guy was their brother, too, and he really was. And so we didn't, at that time, we didn't have security cameras and everything, so I stuck, staked it out, and I saw the young man who I'd known for years. I t- taught him how to surf, and I'd gr- he'd grown up with me as his mentor and then his... his uh, his employer and uh, went through problems of life with him, discussed life situations and caught him stealing. And it was a Mm. lot of money. I didn't know how much. So anyway, it got pretty messy because he was, we were good friends with his parents and uh, our partner Ron was around then too and his kids were best friends with him and and, uh, it got really ugly, really ugly, really quick. So fast forward 20 years, and I had spoken to the guy before, and, you know, I, I, I said, yeah, we make mistakes in life, but we got to learn from them. So fast forward 20 years, he came in, and he handed me an envelope with $3,000 in it. And he said, Duke, this is every penny I ever stole from you and Paul, and it's the worst mistake I ever made in my life. I apologize, and I need to get this monkey off my back. That's amazing. And he ended me. It's actually six grand, but I only gave three to Paul. (laughs) (laughs) So, and and to me, when I heard those stories, when I hear those stories, you know, it just gives me, you know, I remember getting chicken skin listening to you, you know, but I think the cool thing is that, Duke, you had said, you know, when you guys started this, you didn't, you didn't enter this thing, you said, with the vision of putting everything on the line. But that's what ended up happening. And I think sure. you guys did it. You persevered. You have succeeded. You overcame hurdles. You overcame weather. You had good years and bad years. You've made great relationships and great friends. So I think, um, and, and in fact, you guys are celebrating what essentially your 25th year of Surfside business. Right. Is that right? So here's to that. So, I want to get to a couple questions. We'll get to. I want to do a couple questions in the in the audience. So maybe if anybody's got a couple questions, we might have time for a couple. But I want to do a couple of little quick rapid fire questions here for you, and and get what uh, get some answers from you. But so, Paul, this is for you. You decide it's never too late for a next chapter. What's your next career act? Oh. <laughs> You mean bean counter and janitor aren't enough? It's up to you. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, anything goes. I, uh, I honestly can't, can't say at this point. All right. Uh, I haven't thought surf that trip? Way. Yeah, surf trip. But to get back in the water. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let's get you back in the water. <laughs> what, are, what is the next act? What is the next act for Surfside? I mean, you guys are, you guys are, Spring chicken, still technically speaking, but I mean, where don't you know? don't, don't kiss her. Else. All right, all right. You're 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 in your 60s and 70s. You got another 25 years left in the tank. Who's taking? You know, who's going to run Surfside? Will you be at your desk? What's We're the- very fortunate that Duke's two sons, who are hiding back here somewhere, Joe and have, Dave, have in good hands have stepped up and have have in, have begun to take their place in in helping to run the place you know but when i talk to my sons i tell them hey you know you guys got to understand what me and your uncle have gone through to get you to this point yeah. it's like you've just been given this turbo turbo carrera and we started out with a piece of shit <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, this turbo carrera is only going to run <coughs> good if you know how to drive it well and you know how to navigate the waters that it's going to have to go through. And, uh, and they do. They, they seem to get a grasp on the situation because they lived it. Yeah. They, they remember when dad didn't go to their birthdays because I had to man the store. They remember when, when uh, mom had to clean houses on the side in order to buy, get enough money so we could take him camping on a shoestring budget. I mean, they, they lived it. So they knew it wasn't like this and the money wasn't nearly as good as it is now. Yeah. And uh, so they've lived it and they understand it and they know what, what Paula, my sister, and me and their mother went through to get to this point. They, they've lived it. They've ridden that, that, that wave of, of failure and the reforming of success. Yeah. 
But well, there's no guarantees, Garrett. That's there, right, no. Eric, there's no guarantees. Well, do you guys mind if we take a couple questions from for the sure. audience, from your friends? Does yeah. anybody have a question here for, uh, for Duke or Paul? Because I've got a couple more I'm going to dive into. Oh, there's one way in the back, way in the back. It's, it's my wife, Sibley. Did you hear that? So if you so could yeah, recreate... If we could cre recreate Surfside anywhere in the world, where would it be? Yeah. Paul, where would you do it? Korean Island. <laughs> in California? No, wherever or you want. Anywhere there. in the world. Uh, but it's probably just a part of what I deal with, with my skin issues. I would love to be... Uh, so first, I'd love to be in, in Hawaii, because that is the birthplace of, of modern surfing. Secondly, it'd probably be Costa Rica to have a place somewhere like that because Pura Vida, you know, it's got, it's got a great attitude. It would be wonderful to be a part of that. Pura yeah. yeah. Mine would be Maypole, Texas because we like to fish and shoot pigs. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who guys, who was, one of your, who was your, one of your most memorable shoppers? One of your most memorable customers? Yeah. Celebrity or other? I saw Mark Richards up here. Who? Oh, yeah. MR. Who walked into the store that just got you going, whoa? Hulk Hogan. Yeah, Hulk Hogan was one of them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, well, you mean like famous people or? Yeah, most likely. I mean, that would probably be the most likely answer, but it could be anybody. You know, that this just... person isn't famous, but she was a very nice lady, and I talked to her about an hour and a half, and she, we were talking about dogs, and, and she said, uh, very good to meet you, and I shook her hand, and her hand was full of diamond rings, or, and then she left, and somebody goes, Duke, do you know who that was? I go, no, who was it? Joan Irvine. Oh, really? Yeah, it, was pretty, it was pretty inspiring. Did, yeah. did she buy anything? Yeah, I don't even know. Oh, I don't geez. even know. I was just talking with her. How about yeah. the shop dogs? You said dogs. Tell yeah. Yeah, Rocky. What's Rocky. up with the shop dogs? Pickles. Yeah. Pickles. And before that, it was uh, Nishka. Nishka. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the dogs bring a certain personality to this story yeah. that has a, a calming effect on all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we talked about passing the torches. Any other questions? EJ. Wait, 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 wait. And hey, you're not allowed on the stage. <laughs> I'm so free. I'm so free now. I do have a serious question for you guys, though. It seems to me, and just tell me if my observation that moment. So, would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and I think it's summed up by, you know, in, in the retail world, and I'm sure that you've been exposed to it just like I was, you're supposed to read these books where sell, 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 add-on sales, you got to do this, you got to do that. And, and to me, it was just bullshit. I want to I make friends with those people. I really don't care if they buy anything. I mean, they better buy it sometime. We're going to go out of business. But if I'm able to bond with them and make friends with them, I mean, we bonded over a dog or a kid or a, a passion or a dream or a trip or a school. And then, you know what? Oh, yeah, I forgot we sell surfers and snowboards. <laughs> and they buy it. And, and, and it comes from the heart. It's not calculating on my part. And, and if you're able to bond with them and then 30 years in the community, I guess I've made more friends and I've pissed off people because yeah. that's what the strength of our brand is the community. We're a community-based store. We don't get very many tourists at all. We get repeat customers, generations of repeat customers because Newport Beach, Costa Mesa is unlike any very few places in the world. People don't grow up go to elementary school, high school, college, and then move away, they do the exact same thing and move home because this is the best place to live in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a, that's a great, especially since I don't have my notes anymore, I'm, I'm at a loss. Um, I think that's a great place to end, though, with Costa Mesa. That's the whole point, though, bringing this community together and celebrating our local heroes, our local entrepreneurs and brand builders, and people like yourselves that have made our industry great and fun and personable, and the community, you know, in our neighborhood, a great and um, a great place. So, big thank you to you guys both for your leadership, your friendships, 
the business that we've done, and for being here tonight to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you, Derek. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Join us again next month. We have guests every month. Go down to Surfside Sports. Get your last board before the snow melts. <laughs> Thanks, guys.